Hi, everybody. Welcome to the virtual monthly meeting of the Westport Astronomical Society. Uh, I'm Alex Kuhn. I'm the treasurer. You can't see me right now because the technology is, well, somewhat uh, experimental. But we've uh, got a set of excellent speakers tonight. Glad uh, at least tw 24 of you have joined us. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, getting through this uh, virus incident in a way that still at least lets us uh, talk about uh, our astronomical interests and still do some science in the community. Um, with us is uh, Shannon Calvert, our president, uh, Cal Powell as almost always, and our guest speaker is uh, Jonathan Frump. So now I'm going to uh, switch it over to uh, Shannon, who's going to start the meeting like we normally do if we were all in person. So, Shannon? Okay. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Bear with me. Start sharing. Come on. All right, that should come up in 20 or 30 seconds. So uh, welcome everybody. Excuse the glitches. This is our first run. So it should be interesting. Um, there we go. That hopefully will switch to a full screen mode shortly. We'll pretend it will. So this is the situation we're at. The observatory is currently closed because of the coronavirus. So it's suspended until further notice. We won't be having any live events or public viewing or anything. Um, some key holders, there's uh, probably less than a dozen that are actually trained on the new scope can go in and check on it, make sure mice aren't eating anything, but that's currently where we stand. Uh, hopefully we won't have to do too many of these meetings. Um, you know, looking around the room, this is the lowest attendance I've seen, but hopefully uh, this is only going to happen one or two more times and then we'll be done. So let me just move this back to Cal Powell and get him started there. So I have to stop sharing my screen somehow. Uh, all right, I should be off. Cal, if you want to take over. Okay, welcome everyone. And this is another virtual Cal's Corner coming your way. And you should see the normal drop down, as it were. Anyway, this month we'll be talking about the constellation Puffus. Puffus is Latin for the poop deck or the ship's stern, the back of the ship. It was carved out of the former constellation Argo Navis. Argo Navis, the ship Argo, by Nicholas Louis de la Caille in 1752. And uh, the way it got carved up, uh, the existing Argo Navis Greek letter star designations were kept. And so as a result, uh, the brightest star in Puppis is not Alpha, but Zeta. And we'll see that a little later. So Puppis is visible to the south in the evening sky from January through April. And it's bordered by Monoceros, Canis Major, Columba, Pictor, Carina, Vela, Pyxis, and Hydra. It is the 20th constellation in size at 673 square degrees. And it's one of two constellations that have both nominative and genitive names being the same. The only other constellation that is has that property is Camelopardalis, the giraffe. So there is a look at the constellation. These stars, the Zeta star is the brightest one. It's called Naos from the Greek word for ship. It's a type O, so it's a very hot star, magnitude 2.25, and it's also a rapid rotator. Pi Puppis, a hottie from the Arabic phrase for having much promise, 
is a double star, but very close. Magnitudes 2.7 and 6.9. Separation about 0.7 of an arc second. And a type K star. And the third brightest star is Rho. It's magnitude 2.8. Uh, type F star, and it's a delta scuti type variable. Some double stars. Sigma, magnitudes 3.3 and 8.8, .8, types K and G, separation 22 seconds of arc. Five puppets is a, another double star, magnitudes 5.7, 7.3. Both types F and separation 1.3 seconds of arc. And lowercase k puppets, magnitudes 4.4 and 4.6, types B, separation 10 seconds of arc. And Burnham 202, magnitude 6.9 and 9.9, uh, B type star, separation 8 seconds of arc. Some variables. C pubis is a long period variable, gets as bright as magnitude 7.3 and goes down below 14 over 499 days, and it's a type M star. X pubis is a Cepheid variable. It varies from magnitude 8.0 to 9.2 over 26 days, a type F star. And RS puppis is a, another Cepheid variable. It varies from magnitude 7 down to 8 over 41 days, also a type F star. Some exoplanets. HD 60532 is a type F star, magnitude 4.5. It's 84 light years away. And it has two known exoplanets, one that is one times Jupiter mass at about 8 astronomical units away from the host star with a 202-day orbit. It also has a 2.5 Jupiter mass exoplanet further out, 1.6 AU, and with a 600-day orbit. And HD 69830 is a type G star, magnitude 6, 41 light years away. And it has three exoplanets, all about a uh, hot Neptune uh, type, 10 Earth, Earth mass exoplanet uh, at uh, 8 hundredths of an AU with a nine-day orbit, a 12 Earth mass exoplanet at about two-tenths of an AU with a 32-day orbit, and an 18 Earth mass exoplanet at uh, about 0.6 AU with a 197-day orbit. Now the Milky Way comes roaring through Puppis, so there are lots of good things to see here. And so some of the highlights are M46 uh, and NGC 2438. This is a twofer. The M object is an open cluster, magnitude 6.1, 27 arc minutes in diameter. And in front of it, there is a mag 11.5 planetary nebula uh, at NGC 2438. When your observatory opens with your new telescope, it should be pretty easy to see the planetary. M47 is another open cluster, magnitude 4.4 and about half a degree in diameter. M93, further south, is an open cluster. It's magnitude 6.2 and 22 uh, arc minutes across. NGC 2477, even further south, is also known as Caldwell 71. It's an open cluster. It's magnitude 5.8. It's very rich, full of stars, about 20 arc minutes across. Another planetary is NGC 2440. It's magnitude 9.4 and about 74 arc seconds by 42 arc seconds and for the galaxy fans among us, there's NGC 2517. 
It's a barred lenticular galaxy, magnitude 11.8, and it's pretty small at 1.7 arc minutes by about 1.4 arc minutes. So that's this month's Cal's Corner, the Constellation Puppets. Thanks for being with me, folks, and we'll see what next month brings. Take care. And be safe. Thank you, Cal. Thanks, Cal. Okay. All righty. Back to Shannon. So I guess we're back to me. So I'm going to switch to my other screen. The window. Come on. I didn't, Interesting. I didn't see it uh, go full screen before, so you might just size it. Um, it should be full screen now. I just switched it on. Yep, now it is. Okay. So, continuing our makeshift lecture. Um, normally we do the observatory report and our treasury report, but we're going to kind of skip over those for the most part here. Um, the important things are we had a big fundraiser. So thank you, WASP members. We had a huge total. Our goal was, I think, 4000 We ended up with $6,474 and nine cents. Not that anybody contributed nine cents. I think that's just uh, the way that it works out once Giving Day takes their little cut. That's right. So, so that's still tremendous. It enables us to do uh, even more than we had planned. So that's going to eventually help with some other um, projects going forward that are currently suspended, but that's a huge deal. So with that, we immediately sprang into action, and by me, I mean, or by we, I mean Bob and Skip and Carl, and just a couple of days after the fundraiser, we already took out the 16-inch uh, that we had in the dome, and we installed the new telescope. That's the crew or most of the crew that was there that day. And you can see the telescope up on the pier there. And you can also see that it's over all of our heads, which is a little bit of a problem. Um, originally, we were trying to get the pier a little bit higher because uh, the 16 inch was a problem on that mount. Sometimes you had to do the limbo to get underneath to see the eyepieces. And we thought being up higher would be good, but we're not that tall. So um, Carl and um, Mike have worked out a shorter little extension on that pier. We're going to bring it down about eight inches soon, hopefully. So that should be great. Moving right along, we do still have some calendars. If anybody cares about this here anymore, <laughs> it's, it's been pretty bad uh, for an extra couple bucks. We'll rip out March through May. And let's get into some photos. This is Zane's old C8. It's one of the originals, one of the first C8s. And you can see it's uh, got the um, fossil crust on there from the layers that it was excavated from. This is the original paint job. And he had Dana Weisbrot spray paint this and finish it in his professional shop. And now it looks incredible. That's pretty amazing. Looks good. That is the oldest brand new Celestron scope out there. Dana was also shooting outside. This is his Rosette Nebula. It had a little bit of processing help from me. He did most of the work, to be honest. You know, he won't claim it, but he did a lot of the work. And I just uh, brought out a little bit of the nebulosity. Uh, as soon as we got the 14 inch installed, of course, we were all eager to jump on there and throw a camera on the new telescope. And Steve Labkoff was jumping in first. So he got this shot of the moon, this uh, three panel mosaic, I believe. And uh, this is where we're at. So this literally is the first light. This is the first shot off the new telescope. And, you know, he, he gave me about half an hour, of just one more shot, just one more shot. So he went over and he got uh, a single frame of the Orion Nebula. And it's a single frame, so it's it's noisy and a little rough, but you can see the detail that the resolution affords. Uh, while I was up there, he was also outside shooting, so uh, Steve Labkoff got the Rosette Nebula here and the Leo Trio, Leo Triplet. 
So M66, M65, and the Hamburger Galaxy on the left. Then I got on the telescope and I shot the, oh no, that's his. Uh, this is also Steve Laukos. This is uh, from later on, I think it was March 7th. Uh, I opened it up for his wife so he could get another couple shots. So uh, this is Steve Labkoff's moon from later on that I processed. Uh, hopefully he doesn't mind me showing that version. Uh, but it really shows the amount of detail that he was able to bring out. I like the blue part of the moon up on the top. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, the blue is real. Uh, that's areas that are rich in titanium. So that's kind of a cool thing that you don't usually see. Um, this is Michael Southam's shot of Comet Pan-STARRS T2, uh, which is pretty impressive just because it's really difficult to process comet shots. You have to process all the stars separately without the comet and then process the comet separately without the stars and then combine them. So it's not easy. So good job there, Michael. Um, this is Alex Cohn's moon. He was there, I think, March 9th or whatever day that the, all of us were getting training. And I helped with processing on this version. And again, you can see the color, uh, different areas of reddish and orangish and bluish minerals. Um, I was kind of busy this month. We had a few good days. So this is the Leo triplet again. And M81, M82. Uh, both of these shots are lots of data from multiple uh, sessions. This is two different sessions from last year. This is one session from last year, both combined with another uh, couple hours from this year. This is a relatively lame NGC 2403. Um, I expected to get a lot more data on it. But unfortunately, after a Meridian flip, somehow I jostled the camera and the focus was out, so I lost half of my frames. But still, it's kind of interesting, and it doesn't help that this particular galaxy is kind of fuzzy to begin with. This is M100 and another little NGC galaxy up above. Again, I expected to have a lot more time. This was the same night as 2403. Um, I got started on this one and was kind of rubbing my hands together, expecting something good. And all of a sudden it was completely overcast. Like in the span of two frames, it went from totally clear to totally overcast. So that was the end of that night. And I got a little over an hour, I think, or about an hour, just shy of an hour. Finally, I got to use the new telescope. So this was my first shot, also of the moon on uh, the 14 inch. In my case, this is two frames stitched together. I could almost fit it, the whole thing in my camera, but not quite. So I had to overlap them and stitch a couple together. And this was the first really good session um, where I spent, I uh, forget offhand, probably an hour and a half on M82, the Cigar Galaxy. And that is just amazing. That's stunning. Uh, yeah, the amount of detail and the, the fine little uh, spots that it picks up is just amazing. There's a whole lot of resolution here. And I should point out that this telescope still isn't totally collimated. Uh, it was way off when we got it, and Bob and I adjusted it, so it's pretty close. Uh, but we didn't want to go too nuts because we're going to have to take the thing down to do more work on the pier and also install some more parts on the telescope itself. So there's no point in really fine-tuning it at this point, but that was pretty cool. Uh, I also got the same night, I went for M100 and that NGC Galaxy. So this is the same shot or same scene as my earlier one off my four and a half inch refractor. But this shows you just how amazing the detail is on the, on the new one, all the resolution. I should, I should go back here, let's see. Uh, so that's my four and a half. And you can see it's just kind of muddy and nasty. There's not a whole lot of detail. And that's with the new scope, with the exact same camera settings and the exact same amount of time. So huge, huge step up for us. That's fantastic. 
And that's a moonshot that I got later on, also the same night that, that Steve was there with his wife. Um, in my case, I had to stitch together four of them to get it all in there. Um, the detail is pretty darn amazing. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here to give you an idea. Hmm. That's ridiculous. And this is a single frame. It's even better if you stack them and, and do all the little uh, processing that you can do on it. But this is just a single shot off a of DSLR. And you can see just incredible details. And this is Franco uh, coming in. This is from February 23rd off his Solar Max 90 scope, showing prominences all around the edge, the ring of fire shot. Very cool. Nice as always, Franco. Of course. That's always Franco. He always comes out with the cool stuff. This one's a close up with a different telescope on March 8th of Active Region 2758. So not quite as sharp as some of his other ones, but it's because of the different telescope. And future OS events are currently in doubt. So we do still have speakers that we can do if this is successful. Hopefully it is. Um, all the near coming events like the uh, Messier Marathon that was supposed to be this coming weekend, that's off. Um, NEF has been postponed, although on April 4th there is a virtual uh, NEF, not quite the same thing, but you can at least participate in some way and that will be postponed. So we'll have some kind of live event, I think, in September. Um, hopefully this will abate by maybe June and we can get to the barbecue picnic and have some of the other events later on. As far as astronomical events, there's nothing. Um, I went on a search and I stuck in the Lyrid's meteor shower. So there's at least that, and it happens to be right at the new moon. So that should be a fairly good one. Um, otherwise, that's it. There's an Eta Aquarius in early May, but that's right at full moon. So you might as well just cross that off. There's a penumbral lunar eclipse on June 5th. And if you happen to be on the other hemisphere, you can see that. Otherwise, we're kind of out of luck. So I'm going to bring up our speaker, Dr. Jonathan Trump. Uh, this is normally where we break for milk and cookies, so make it quick. And let's get him on here. And I'm going to switch my sharing off. And we should be back to Dr. Trump. Take it from here. All right. Um, well, thanks. It's a pleasure to join everybody. Uh, sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, so if you, well, I, I recommend, oh, I'm sorry, give me just a moment. Yeah, share share your, uh, your, your, your screen there. Yeah. Okay, and share application window. Okay, here we go. All right. Looks good. Thanks. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a pleasure to join you, even if remotely. Um, if you are in a, well, I, I recommend you turn the lights down. You know, I, I know there's no milk and cookies. You're at home, grab a beverage, whatever you like. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend some time talking about our view of the universe from the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and also looking ahead at the, the tremendous legacy of Hubble continuing in the near future and also the expanding legacy of space telescope observations using the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. Um, so I'm an assistant professor. I cover our courtesy of NASA and ESA. This is an actual photograph of the Hubble Space Telescope taken by one of the astronauts uh, during a servicing mission. Hubble is not unusual among space telescopes in that we have lots and lots of pictures of it from astronauts when they went out to work on it. So I always like to start out uh, by just reminding everybody it wasn't that long ago that our view of the, of the night sky was really not much more than here there are be monsters. Uh, so this is actually just from the 17th century, just a few hundred years ago. This is made by the Dutch cartographer Frederick de Witt. Um, and you can see, you know, it's, it's quite a beautiful illustration, um, but it doesn't contain much physical detail about how everything works. And actually in this map from de Witt, 
you actually see the uh, Ptolemy's geocentric model in the upper center, as well as the uh, heliocentric model, the new heliocentric model of Copernicus in the bottom center, because even, you know, just a few hundred years ago, we were fighting about very basic details like this. And so, you know, it's kind of tremendous thinking about how far we've come in the past few hundred years, right? You know, ancients knew about things like eclipses. They could predict phases of the moon. Um, they knew about the other planets in our solar system. But really, our view of the universe has just expanded tremendously, especially in the past 30 years with the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. And so Hubble will actually turn 30 years old next month. Uh, here is a picture of Hubble launching. Um, uh, I'm forgetting which shuttle this was. I think Columbia. Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm not. Uh, Discovery, I'm sorry. Hubble launched on Discovery. Oh, you see it right there on the wing. <laughs> um, so Hubble was actually initially conceived in a paper written by Lyman Spitzer way back in 1946. This is actually... Before the dawn of the space age, astronomers were already dreaming about the kinds of things we could learn from telescopes in space. Um, from you know its initial conception in 1946, of course, it took many years, right, almost 45 years until it was actually launched. This was actually delayed by the Challenger disaster. Hubble was ready to go and ready to launch uh, earlier in the 1980s, but of course, the whole Hubble, excuse me, the whole shuttle program shut down for several years, um, and Hubble went up in 1990. Um, so the big reason to launch Hubble and to put telescopes in space at all, uh, the biggest reason that, that Spitzer wanted to put a telescope in space, was just because we avoid the blurring effects of the atmosphere. You know, so I have young children, so I always talk about this as twinkle, twinkle, little star is real, right? Um, so any kind of observations you make on the ground are fundamentally limited by the seeing limits of the atmosphere, uh, which even at the best sites, not here in Connecticut, the best sites you know, in, in mountains, in deserts, um, you know, we'll give you a picture like you see here on the left. So this is an image of a supernova exploding in a distant galaxy, NGC 3370. Uh, and then, of course, you see the same image taken by Hubble, the same galaxy imaged by Hubble on the right, right? Just spectacular image quality. Um, res Hubble has a native image resolution of about 0.06 arc seconds per pixel. Uh, pretty tremendous. Well, sorry, it has a native resolution of 0.06 arc seconds. Uh, this is actually finer than its pixel grid, and so you actually do some uh, image processing tricks to get down to the resolution that Hubble gets uh, up in orbit. Now, as everybody knows, the initial optics of Hubble, uh, as everybody probably knows, the initial optics were machined incorrectly, and the first pictures taken by Hubble were quite disappointing. Um, Hubble, uh, astronomers and engineers quickly devised a solution, and in fact, in subsequent generations of instruments uh, installed on Hubble, uh, astronomers and engineers fixed this imaging problem, and we now have the kinds of spectacular images you see here on the right. Um, so Hubble, you know, was designed to be serviced by astronauts. This is actually a photo taken by one of the astronauts uh, during the very last space shuttle mission. Uh, that was in 2009, right? And this was the very last visit by astronauts to Hubble uh, 11 years ago, right? The very last time the space shuttle lifted off uh, from Earth. Uh, the U.S. does not currently have a, you know, its own launch vehicle, and so it's really unclear what the future of Hubble will bring. Hubble is currently in good health. Um, we had a few scares last year. Hubble points over the sky using gyroscopes, right, to maintain stability. So, you know, so Hubble moves around and then maintains uh, a stable pointing on, a, on some guide star using gyroscopes. And there are six gyroscopes on Hubble, three are dead and three are operational. That's enough for full science operations, but one of those three gyroscopes has been a little flaky in some of its sensor readings. And actually Hubble shut down for a few weeks, I wanna say just over a year ago. Um, it was a little nerve wracking for me because I actually had a program on Hubble last spring. I'll show some pictures of that later in this talk. Um, Astronomers and engineers here on the ground at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is actually on the Johns Hopkins campus in Baltimore, um, managed to diagnose this problem, and we think everything is going smoothly. But eventually those gyroscopes will start to hiccup and eventually fail uh, in the future, and it's really not clear what will happen for the future of Hubble when that happens. There are ideas floating around about robotic servicing missions. Uh, you know, as I said, NASA does not currently have a manned space program. 
And so it's the future of Hubble is a little bit in doubt. When Hubble does cease operations, there is a contract between NASA and the Smithsonian Institute. And NASA owes the Hubble Space Telescope to the Smithsonian, apparently to put in the rafters of the Air and Space Museum so we can all go check it out. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if that's not followed through. It's going to be a big effort to collect Hubble, bring it down, and put it in the rafters of the Air and Space Museum. Uh, but I also look forward to if you know Hubble isn't if I don't get to drive Hubble anymore and I don't get to take spectacular pictures of the universe, at least I go get to visit it with my family. All right, so. Hubble has taken a tremendous uh, range of fantastic and beautiful images and has also produced a pretty fantastic range of discoveries. And so when Hubble was first launched, right, there was a proposal that NASA put over to Congress, um, you know, saying, here are the kinds of things we think Hubble could do. And those things include uh, something very near and dear to my heart trying to understand the host galaxies of rapidly creating supermassive black holes. Uh, it also, well, it included some things about learning about the planets in our solar system, uh, things like this. But I have to say, if you make a similar list of the unexpected discoveries from Hubble, things like the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, right? The list of unexpected discoveries doubles at least the list of expected discoveries. Right. And so, you know, launching a, a space telescope like like Hubble and, and just opening an entirely new window on how we view the universe, I think, has led to more unexpected breakthroughs and, and, and larger leaps in our scientific understanding of, of the you know, nature of time and space than I think any of us could have anticipated. And so I'm going to highlight some of Hubble's discoveries uh, over the next few slides, and I'm going to do this sort of organized by distance from Earth. I'll start off with planets, you know, things that are light minutes to light hours away, and then I'll go to things, stars in our galaxy, light years to thousands of light years away, eventually discussing galaxies, which may be millions to billions of light years away, and then expanding out and talking about uh, the, the scale of the fabric of our universe, right? Going out to billions of light years away, talking about some of the first structures in the galaxy. So if we start in our own solar system, Right. Uh, you know, I told you that one of the biggest reasons astronomers launched Hubble was because it gives a much cleaner and crisper view of the heavens. Right. It avoids the twinkling of light traveling through differential refraction in our atmosphere. But Hubble also has ultraviolet and infrared capabilities that you just can't do on the ground. So we have this pesky thing in our Earth's atmosphere called the ozone layer. Right? I guess it's fine for protecting you from a sunburn, but it's pretty bad for astronomers because that ozone layer blocks ultraviolet, ultraviolet light. Hubble, sitting above the ozone layer, uh, observes extremely effectively in the ultraviolet. Right? And I actually use Hubble quite a bit for ultraviolet observations. This is an example of the kinds of ultraviolet observations that Hubble can do, right? Pictures of the aurora of Saturn and of Jupiter, right? Uh, you know, the same kinds of aurora that produce the northern lights here on Earth, but of course, Saturn and Jupiter have much stronger magnetic fields and so as a, as a result, have much uh, more brilliant aurora uh, going on here. So these, these pictures were actually taken using the STIS instrument, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, observing in the ultraviolet. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to say the image of Jupiter was in 1998. And the image of Saturn was in 2005. One of the coolest unexpected discoveries of Hubble uh, was plumes of water vapor coming off of Europa. Right. So here's a picture of Europa, actually not taken by Hubble, uh, but taken by, I want to say, the Galileo spacecraft. Uh, now, in the upper right, so what you actually see here is an image of Europa superimposed on Hubble, blurry blue Hubble images of water vapor, right, sitting above uh, that location of Europa. Right. So, um, yeah. This is the best evidence we have for water somewhere else in our solar system. Right? This is water vapor plumes popping out from Hubble. Uh, Hubble made this observation in 2012, and actually there was a result just a few months ago confirming that yes, in fact, uh, with a closer and deeper look using Hubble, uh, it does really look like the signature of water vapor sitting in those plumes being ejected through some kind of icy crust of Europa, perhaps with a liquid ocean underneath. And NASA is currently busy uh, planning a Europa Clipper experiment, uh, which would launch a spacecraft to orbit around Europa, 
uh, try and sample, actually take samples of this water vapor as it's flying off of Europa. This, this mission, the Europa Clipper, would launch sometime in the 2030s. So continuing outward, right, Hubble is also largely responsible for the fact that Pluto has been demoted and is no longer considered a planet. Right, so when I was a kid sitting in school, right, we all learned that there are nine planets in the solar system. Already when I teach astrophysics, I ask my students, so how many planets are there? And they say, oh, there's eight, eight planets. Everybody knows this, right? Uh, and this is largely because Hubble found that Pluto is not the only dwarf planet out there in the outer solar system, right? So Hubble led to the discovery of Eris, as well as its little moon, Dysnomia. Uh, also, Makimaki, uh, there's Kwawar, Haumea. Um, I'm missing at least a couple, right? But the discovery of all these additional dwarf planets uh, sort of forced astronomers to reconsider, all right, so either we expand the number of planets and we say that there are at least 15 and probably an additional several that we don't know about sitting in the solar system, things like Pluto that we haven't yet discovered in the outer solar system, or we revise the number of planets down to eight. We, you know, we note that Pluto and Eris and Makimaki and these other dwarf planets are quite different. Uh, they probably form differently. They have more elliptical orbits. They're also more inclined to the plane of the other planets. Um, and so, you know, astronomers actually voted at an international astronomical union meeting, I want to say back in something like 2006, um, and decided that, well, okay, we're going to have this new classification of dwarf planets, and then we have the eight sort of regular planets in our solar system. Yeah, so if you don't like this, I guess blame Hubble and its spectacular image capabilities and spectacular discovery capabilities. All right, so stepping out from beyond planets to stars, uh, the Pillars of Creation is probably the most iconic Hubble image it's ever taken. I think they had some kind of you know March Madness bracket a couple of years ago, uh, maybe for the 25th anniversary five years ago, where people voted on what is the best Hubble image. And I believe that the Pillars of Creation was the winning submission. Um, but one of the really cool things about Hubble is that it doesn't just take one image of a thing, right? Because it was designed to be visited by, uh, visited by astronauts and have new instruments installed, right? And continually expand its capabilities. You can actually get improved images of things like this. So this is an image of the Pillars of Creation in 1995. And here's the same region of sky 20 years later. Right, with the wide field camera three and upgraded uh, imager installed in Hubble during the last shuttle mission. Right? And so you just see a completely spectacular level of additional detail. Right, This is a stellar nursery, new stars being born. Okay, um, Yeah, th this image that you see here taken in 2015 has about 20 times the pixels of the 1995 version. Right. So, you know, not a big surprise. Right. Our, our CCD technology has, has expanded dramatically uh, within the past 25 years. Um, but you just see tremendous, tremendous detail uh, with the new imager and, and this capability of being able to upgrade the instrumentation on this space telescope. Now, that's not all. Right. Hubble doesn't just observe in the optical. But you can also take a picture of this same stellar nursery in the infrared. Now, when you observe in the infrared, uh, you actually are able to peer through the dust in your line of sight. And so you see just a, a ridiculously larger number of stars, which are no longer being shrouded by dust in these you know, dense gas clouds in the line of sight. Um, so the sky is blue because blue light scatters more effectively off the dust in our atmosphere. And in the same fashion, you know, blue light and, and optical light from this stuff from within deep within this stellar nursery ends up being scattered out of the line of sight, right? The same reason as a sunset is red because red light is more likely to get through. And so Hubble also has infrared observing capabilities that you just can't do on the ground because at least in the sort of, uh, well, there are a handful of gaps in the near infrared, but once you get to the mid infrared, you just can't do this on the ground because we have all this water vapor in our atmosphere, which is an excellent absorber in the infrared. And so, you know, sitting above our atmosphere with its infrared capabilities, Hubble really gives a spectacular view uh, deep within this stellar nursery, right? We're really watching new stars being born. Uh, here's another example of a stellar nursery, uh, the Orion Nebula, okay? Uh, somewhere, you know, kind of beyond the sword of Orion. Uh, you could actually, you know, see this with a decent telescope or with binoculars. 
Um, but with the fantastic imaging detail of Hubble, you can actually zoom way down deep in the Orion Nebula and not just see stars being born, but actually see protoplanetary debris disks being born around these stars, right? And so Hubble has contributed greatly to our understanding about how not just stars form, but about how solar systems form. And so you see here uh, images of protoplanetary debris disks forming around protostars, right? Eventually in these debris disks, stars uh, settle out. And I will show you an image of, of stars forming in a debris disk in just a few slides. Uh, another example of a beautiful stellar nursery, the Carina Nebula, okay, shown here. Uh, the Carina Nebula, I think, is pretty cool because it has this uh, pretty extreme star. This is the most massive star we know about, Eta Carina. And Eta Carina is actually so massive and so luminous that the fusion in its core is constantly blowing off its outer layers. Okay, And you see an image of Eta Carina and these bubbles popping off of it. Uh, you know, so, so sort of these bubbles are kind of polar bubbles being blown off of this star. And then you kind of have an equatorial disk wind also going off. And with Hubble, you can actually take a spectrum and you can see that this star is, in fact, responsible for making most of the heavy elements. Right. So uh, Carl Sagan has a famous quote. We are all star stuff. Right. Most the universe began as only hydrogen and helium and everything heavier than hydrogen and helium in the periodic table was made in. The, the nuclear fusion forges in the centers of stars. And Eta Carina, massive stars like Eta Carina, are fusing everything all the way up to iron and blowing this out, even a little bit of nickel um, from the neutron-rich environment in its outer layers. Okay, um, so I promised an image of a star actually forming within a debris disk. So this is uh, one of, this is a, another example of the spectacular unexpected discoveries of Hubble. Here you see a debris disk around Fomalhaut B, okay, one of the most famous uh, exoplanet hosting stars. And you can actually see an itty bitty little planet forming out of a gap, right? You see this kind of ring in the debris disk, okay, once you put a coronagraph over the star. Um, and you can see this tiny little fuzzy exoplanet that is actually forming out of the debris disk. And we think this is how all planetary systems form. Uh, you know, a, a cloud of gas in these stellar nurseries collapses down into a star. It has some angular momentum, just like a figure skater. As it collapses downward, it, it speeds up in its rotation. Okay, this eventually leads to a rotating disk of material. Eventually, that you know, uh, dust grains in that disk stick to each other from electrostatic forces, right? Van der Waals forces. Um, and sort of grows and grows until it starts to self-gravitate, and then it clears out a path, right? And as it starts to self-gravitate, it eventually coalesces into a protoplanet, and then eventually a planet, and actually carves out holes uh, in the rings of this planet. Now, you can see this, you know, from any telescope quite spectacularly in the ring system of Saturn, right? You know, and of course, the moons of Saturn similarly clear out uh, gaps in the rings of Saturn. And we think this is how our solar system formed. We think this is how all other solar, system form, solar systems across the universe form. Um, we now know today, largely through the work of a different space telescope, Kepler, okay, uh, that extrasolar planets and extra planet, extrasolar planetary systems are probably the rule rather than the exception, right? And we have thousands of examples of exoplanetary systems, even using the Kepler Space Telescope, which relies on planetary transits, okay, which you require quite precise alignment to detect. Uh, because we detect a few thousand of these, well, we only expect to be able to detect them, you know, something like 1% of the time based on the alignment of the system. We suspect that almost every star in our galaxy has its own planetary system. And so, you know, when, when people ask me, do you think it is likely that there is life out there in the universe? I think it has to be extremely likely given you know, the preponderance of planetary systems. Of course, that leads us to the uh, Fermi paradox, which I won't talk about today, but it, it's an interesting uh, total transformation of the way we understand our universe. All right. Um, one object I want to showcase in particular, the Crab Nebula. This is a supernova remnant. And I'd like to talk about the Crab Nebula because Hubble is not the only space telescope launched by NASA up in the sky. Um, Hubble, excuse me, NASA actually has a suite of great observatories uh, that actually can observe the night sky and everything from 
uh, well, infrared to visible to ultraviolet to X-rays and gamma rays, right? So you see at the bottom, uh, this particular object, a supernova remnant, looks quite different depending on what wavelength you observe it. And so, you know, the, the color image you see here is a visible light, false color composite image taken by Hubble, right? Uh, taken, of course, in several different filters and then combined together for this false color image. Um, the Crab Nebula actually has a, a lot of emission lines. You know, it, it's actually energized very similarly to a fluorescent light. So when you take a spectrum of it, you see quite bright emission lines, actually lots of nickel lines in this Crab Nebula um, and lots of oxygen lines as well. Um, but when you look at it in different wavelengths of light, you actually see, for example, in the infrared, lots of dust generation going on, uh, dust production, which is quite a bit cooler and so peaks in the infrared. Uh, when you look down in the X-rays, you actually see a little disk and a little jet associated with what we think is a neutron star sitting in the center of the Crab Nebula. And when you look in gamma rays, you actually see just that point source neutron star, right? Um, I think many of you may have been watching the news about Betelgeuse lately. So Betelgeuse famously has been dimming recently. Uh, we think this is probably because Betelgeuse has been shedding a lot of dust. And so it's actually been dimming just because there's a lot of dust in the line of sight. Um, Betelgeuse is probably the best candidate of all the massive stars in the sky to go supernova any day now. And by any day now, I mean astronomical timescales, like, well, within the next few hundred thousand years. Eta Carina is probably another really good example of something that might go supernova. Our galaxy is pretty overdue for the next supernova, right? We haven't had one for a few hundred years. Um, yeah, the Crab Nebula, I believe, went off in something like, I think it's the supernova that was observed in 1066, but uh, maybe 1054, uh, something like a thousand years ago. All right, so now I'm going to step from stars to galaxies. Um, so I am an extragalactic astronomer. I study other galaxies. And in particular, I study the supermassive black holes that sit within. Um, so I'll just start off just by showing some, you know, some of the really, really spectacular and cool images that Hubble has taken. Here's the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51, right? M51 actually has a nearby satellite galaxy that it's interacting with, okay? Uh, so this image that you see here is actually a false color image that combines UV, optical, and infrared. And so the, the nice blue that you see is UV imaging of stellar nurseries like Orion or Carina, right? These are places new stars are being born. Uh, the red regions are clumpy, dusty regions, right, uh, that are blocking that UV light, uh, probably even denser stellar nursery regions. And we actually think that M51 has a lot of star formation because it's interacting with its uh, neighboring companion. So, you know, Hubble's not just great for taking cool images of, of distant galaxies, um, but it's also really good for looking at some of our nearest neighbors. And so uh, FAT, the Pan Hubble Astronomical Treasury, I think, um, or excuse me, Pan Hubble Andromeda Treasury Project. Astronomers always like these tortured acronyms. The FAT Project, PH. Um, this was the largest allocation of Hubble time ever. And uh, it actually stepped over about half of M51. You can see the overlay of the larger M51 and the FAT region in the lower right of your screen. Um, and actually, by taking this kind of picture of Andromeda, we can actually count individual stars and star clusters in Andromeda. And we can try to learn things like, it, it actually turns out to be easier to study M31 than our own Milky Way, because, you know, painfully in our own Milky Way, we're sort of, you know, trying to look through a pancake, right? We're, we're sort of embedded within this dense structure of stars. Um, and we have a pretty incomplete understanding of our own galaxy. We actually don't even know how many spiral arms there are in our own galaxy or whether or not we have a bar. These are things that astronomers are still arguing about. Andromeda is the sort of nearest Milky Way-like analog to our own. Um, and so we can do things like count individual stars and try and understand, for example, the initial mass function of stars. Right? When we look at a stellar nursery in Andromeda, we can count the number of low mass stars compared to the number of massive stars and try and understand if we have different conditions for star formation, does that change this initial, initial mass function? Does it change the distribution of low mass stars to massive stars? Uh, just one of the examples of, of the kind of detail you can resolve when you use Hubble. Um, I know I'm a little late for Valentine's Day, but here's a spectacular merging galaxy observed by Hubble, the Rose Galaxy, right? Two galaxies uh, actually com combine, colliding in a major merger. Uh, when major mergers happen within galaxies, 
Uh, they cause tremendous tidal forces, which throw out streams, tidal streams of stars, okay, and sometimes well, I, I think lead to some of the be most beautiful uh, galaxy images that Hubble takes. These major mergers, we think, are also responsible for a lot of what we call galaxy evolution. Galaxy evolution just means the changes in galaxies. Um, we think that mergers drive a lot of, they funnel gas downward. They may fuel supermassive black holes. Um, when they also funnel gas and smash it together, they probably fuel a lot of new star formation. We find that galaxies currently in mergers tend to have highly enhanced star formation rates, for example. Um, now, the distance between stars within an individual galaxy is something like, you know, a few light years, right? The nearest uh, stars from us are, you know, something like four light years away, uh, Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri. And so this actually means that when we collide with Andromeda, which is coming in the next few hundred million years, it probably isn't going to mean a whole lot for our solar system, right? The, as we collide with Andromeda, you know, still the nearest stars are going to be a few light years away, and so they won't do anything to perturb our orbits. Um, however, the constellations in the sky will change quite dramatically. And we also think that because this merger is likely to funnel gas downward towards the new center of the com combination of the two galaxies, uh, our current supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, will merge with the supermassive black hole in the center of Andromeda, make a supermassive black hole about twice as big, and a lot of gas will funnel downward. And so you should actually be able to see <clears throat> the glow of Sagittarius A star, whatever Sagittarius you know, looks like uh, after combining with Andromeda, you should be able to see the glow from matter above the event horizon of this supermassive black hole, possibly even in the daytime, right? Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, so Hubble doesn't just take images. It also is a, has tremendous spectroscopic capabilities. So one of the most recent images installed on Hubble uh, is the Cosmic Origins Spectrograph, an ultraviolet spectrograph. Uh, in the upper left of your screen is an absorption line spectrum taken by COS. And so COS was designed in part to try and understand the gaseous halos of galaxies. So, you know, galaxies ex extend something like a uh, 100,000 light years in diameter, right? Our own Milky Way, for example, 100,000 light years in diameter. But they actually sit within massive gas reservoirs, which may be a million light years in diameter, okay? And, and, and a lot more spherical, whereas a galaxy may be sort of disky in structure. Um, now, this gas has a lot of mass. We actually think that there may be as much across the universe. There's probably as much mass in these gaseous halos, as much baryonic mass, regular matter mass, in these gaseous halos, as there is within galaxies themselves. And Hubble has led to a tremendous breakthrough in understanding that gas. We actually think that gas is constantly being launched out of the galaxy and then falling back down in these massive galactic fountains. All right, so now I'm going to step out the last part of my talk. I want to talk about what we've learned about uh, through Hubble imaging of the very distant universe. And so this is uh, the deepest image Hubble has ever taken. Right? This is the ultra-deep field. Uh, just for comparison, the ultra deep field is a tiny, tiny region of the sky, right? It's something like two by two arc minutes on the sky. Uh, you know, for comparison with the moon, which is actually 30 arc minutes in diameter, right? You can see this is a tiny, tiny region of the sky. I believe if you hold your thumb at arm's length, the thickness of your thumbnail, not the width, but the thickness of your thumbnail is about one arc minute, right? So we're talking about something that is only about twice the thickness of your thumbnail, uh, on a side. And if almost every single thing, everything but those two kind of spiky looking things, which are stars, every other thing in this two by two arc minute field of view on the sky is a distant galaxy. And some of these distant galaxies, particularly the, the tiny and blue kind of squiggly looking ones, some of these are actually galaxies that formed only one or two billion years after the Big Bang. Right? And so Hubble affords our current uh, best view of the most distant galaxies in the universe. I, I want to say the most, you know, astronomers are, 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 this is the kind of thing that is a field of active research, but some of the most distant galaxies Hubble has identified to date are only about half a billion years after the Big Bang. All right, so I, I want to highlight some of my own work with Hubble over the next two slides. Um, so one of the cool things I like to do with Hubble is use uh, its spectro, spectroscopic capabilities. In particular, in 2009, Hubble was outfitted with a new 
slitless grism. A grism is a combination prism grating. It's actually a prism that has grooves on it. Um, and so it gives you lots of low resolution spectra. Um, this is slitless because the light is already collimated because you're up above the atmosphere. You don't have to worry about dispersion of the light. And so you actually get a spectrum of every single thing in the field of view. So in a little two by two arc minute field of view, you get spectra of hundreds of galaxies. This is certainly the greatest advantage of this instrument, but it's also its greatest weakness because many of these uh, spectra end up overlapping on top of the other ones. And so you have to carefully reduce these data and try and remove the contamination from nearby objects. Um, but, you know, so the, the two things at the bottom of the screen are actually from a paper I published a few years ago, um, trying to understand the black hole content of little tiny dwarf galaxies. And in this paper, we actually argue that there's evidence uh, that when you see these tiny little fuzzy sort of bluish galaxies, right, these are galaxies which may be Milky Way progenitors observed in the adolescent universe maybe 10 billion years ago, we actually see evidence that their black holes have already formed and are already growing. So I like to frame this as a chicken or egg problem of which comes first, the galaxy or the black hole. Uh, and at least, you know, in this paper, we found evidence that, in fact, the little black hole egg forms early on in the galaxy chicken's life cycle. Um, one of the coolest things about using Hubble is that when it observes for you, it actually tweets, tweets where it's looking at all times. So, you, you know, you can actually log on to Space Tele, Space Tele Live's uh, Twitter handle and see where it's pointing right now. Um, Let's see, back in 2018, so two years ago, uh, it actually observed the same set of five objects 32 times. And I actually used Hubble to do ultraviolet monitoring of five different supermassive black holes. So in particular, looking at how the ultraviolet light from the inner accretion disk of these objects varied as a function of time. And so you can actually do, uh, use this uh, when you combine it with optical observations taken on the ground, you can actually look at how the light varies from, you know, in the ultraviolet, which comes from the inner disk, and you see that in the sort of upper right. Uh, you may even see my mouse. Um, if you look at the you know, sort of near region of the accretion disk just above the supermassive black hole event horizon, you see a variable light profile looking like this, and you actually see that same light profile repeated in more distant optical and emission line light with a time delay. Oh, I'm sorry. Accidentally hit my mouse. Let's see if I can go back. There we go. Um, and so you can actually use this trick to measure light echoes around a supermassive black hole. Now we know the speed of light very well. And so these light echoes can be translated to a light travel distance, right? Since distance just equals the speed of light times time in this case. Um, if you add another trick, <clears throat> and you can actually measure the velocity of that gas as it's orbiting you can weigh the black hole and measure its mass just using the Virial theorem. Um, I also use this echo mapping technique to measure black hole accretion disks and try and understand the structure of matter as it falls within. All right, uh, one of the other really cool discoveries of Hubble was this crazy reappearing supernova. So, uh, you know, we have this crazy phenomenon in our universe called general relativity. And general relativity tells us that when we have mass in the universe, it bends space and time around it. And so you have, if you have a distant galaxy, right, as you see in the upper right here, its light is actually bent depending on the mass it travels through, right? So mass actually acts like a lens. We call this a gravitational lens. And so, you know, some of the light may be not bent very much. It may come at us quite directly, whereas some of the light ends up taking a much longer path as it's bent around, for example, a massive cluster of galaxies, right? And so we actually have different light travel times depending on which path the light takes. So we actually, in this image in the lower left, see the same galaxy imaged a few times and sort of flipped upside down as it's lensed by this massive galaxy cluster. Um, so it was first observed in 1998, and you actually see the supernova within that galaxy being observed a few times, which is pretty wild. Um, you can see the supernova right here. Um, and then the supernova reappeared in 2014, I, I should say it was not actually discovered in 1998. It was sort of, you know, found later looking back at old images taken in 1998, but it was initially discovered in October 2014. Astronomers said, based on the mass profile of this galaxy cluster, we expect we should see it again in December 2015. And lo and behold, there it was. And Hubble did, in fact, observe this supernova exploding again. Uh, well, supernova exploded only once, right? 
but we observed a different light travel path at a different light travel time of the same supernova in 2015. So this was a really cool test of general relativity. Uh, it was a really interesting way to measure the mass of this central object, you know, and the effects of this mass on gravitational lensing. And also it was a really cool way to sort of map the structure of our universe and the distance scale of you know, this distant supernova. All right. And so I, I want to conclude my talk just looking ahead. Uh, Hubble has given us this pretty spectacular 30 years of astronomical discoveries, beautiful images. Um, but Hubble is just a tiny little 2.4 meter mirror, right? I mean, that's about the size of you know my office, just a little bit bigger in diameter than I'm tall. You know, it's it's not that big. It's you know pretty big for fitting in the shuttle bay. Um, but as telescopes, we have telescopes on the ground that are 10 meters in diameter, right? Um, Hubble also uses somewhat outdated you know optical design and things like this. And we astronomers are pretty eager for the next generation of space telescopes led by James Webb, right? So James Webb actually has a six and a half meter diameter mirror. Uh, this meter really is coated in gold. It's not just colored that way. It turns out gold is an excellent reflector in the infrared. Uh, James Webb is optimized in the infrared so that it can observe the first galaxies. Light of the first galaxies after the Big Bang, right, is highly redshifted by our expanding universe. Um, Optimization in the infrared is also really good for exoplanets. Exoplanets are colder than stars, and so if you want to discover exoplanets, looking at them in the infrared is the way to go. Um, so James Webb also has this massive sun shield you see underneath the mirror. That sun shield is the size of a tennis court. This is a huge, huge spacecraft. It's actually going to be launched on ESA rocket out of French Guiana in, knock on wood, March 2021. Um, the latest from NASA is that at worst, uh, it'll be delayed by only a couple of months. So when I first you know, became a graduate student in 2004, I was told that, oh yeah, and as we all know, Hubble will launch in 2008, so that'll be exciting for graduate school. And of course, it's been delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. Uh, sorry, James Webb, of course, uh, uh, has been delayed and delayed. And uh, yeah, <laughs> the most recent delay was from 2018 to 2021, but I'm told that that 2021 deadline is actually looking pretty good. And at worst, it will launch in summer of 2021. Um, so it will launch. It's going to be all folded up because you can't launch this you know, massive sun shield the size of a tennis court. It will go out to the L2 Lagrange point out beyond the orbit of the moon. This is way further above the Earth than Hubble orbits, as you see in that center image. Uh, and out there at the L2 Lagrange point, where it actually orbits the sun tugged on by the Earth, it will unfold and nothing will go wrong. I hope. <laughs> uh, I'm told by people at NASA that they've actually done this before, uh, but it's not for telescopes that we astronomers use to look out. It's for the kinds of telescopes that look down, that are highly classified. But they say it all works. It's been done before. So uh, I don't know. I, I guess that gives me a little bit of hope. Um, I'm quite excited about James Webb because I'm actually involved in a collaboration for which has already been allocated time on James Webb. Um, and we expect within the first six months to a year, we're going to start directly observing some of the first galaxies and some of the first black holes after the Big Bang. All right. Um, so I just want to leave you as I conclude this talk, uh, just with a, a sort of rose gallery of the spectacular images of Hubble. Um, you know, Hubble cost somewhere between 10 and $15 billion, depending on how you count it. Um, I like to think this has been a great investment. I think I'm, you know, preaching to the choir, uh, talking to all of you. But, you know, if you account this in some ways, right, it's less than $1 per U.S. citizen for each of the years that Hubble has been active. I really think that's worth it. I think most people regard Hubble as a national treasure. I'm told by people, by astronomers who have uh, gone to work in science policy for Congress people, um, for NASA, and they spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill and in the White House, they say, actually, when you talk to all legislators of either political party, they love Hubble, they love astronomy, right? We all share this, this love of, of the night sky and, and trying to understand our place in the universe. And Hubble has been the most spectacular instrument, the most spectacular experiment to teach us more about this. Um, there's a really, really good uh, YouTube video I, I like called Five Reasons the James Webb Space Telescope is Awesome. And, you know, the author of this video argues that, you know, I think perhaps especially now, it's important uh, to, quote unquote, decrease the suck that we have here. You know, it's important to fight poverty, uh, cure disease, things like this. But if, if society was only just about decreasing the suck, this would be pretty boring, right? And it's also really, really important to increase the awesome. 
And I really like uh, framing it that way. Hubble has certainly increased the awesome and the new James Webb Space Telescope has promised to, you know, kind of open an entirely new window for understanding our universe and, I don't know, a giant leap forward in increasing the awesome. And I'll stop there. Thank you. This is the obligatory crowd <laughs> applause. Thank you, John. Absolutely. Uh, we did have a question. Moshe Guy asked if you happen to know the current cost of the James Webb telescope. <laughs> That's a great question. I should have said this. Yeah, so James Webb similarly is expected to cost $10 billion. Um, one of the reasons that James Webb was delayed so many times is because it was actually undersold to Congress. So when NASA first proposed it, they said, oh, don't worry about it. This is just going to cost $2 billion. And then, of course, they rapidly exceeded that cost, and Congress threatened to cut it. Um, this, was a, this was bad politics. NASA knew it wasn't going to cost $2 billion. I don't think they knew it was going to cost $10 billion, um, but they lied. And, you know, they kind of paid the price for it with Congress threatening to come. Um, yeah, so the expectation is it will cost $10 billion. If we see another delay, that cost will only go up, right? Um, and I should say that usually when we account the cost of Hubble and James Webb, we actually don't include the cost of the launch vehicle. So that's really just $10 billion of building the telescope, employing all the engineers, employing all the scientists who work on it and maintain it. Um, and all the tests, right? So, you know, James Webb is currently sitting, I believe, in the Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, where they're doing things like shaking it like crazy to make sure it doesn't break, right? <laughs> Putting it in a vacuum to make sure nothing falls off. Terrifying to me, but I guess that's like a launch of like space. So I guess that makes sense. Yeah, and I guess once you're up to 10 billion, the launch vehicles are rounding error. Well, I, you know, I think every launch costs, I, I don't know the cost of a launch, um, but I think every single one, a massive launch is in the billions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a user. I'm not, well, every, every astronomer wishes they were an astronaut, but unfortunately I'm not. And so I, I, I don't know how launches work entirely, but I do know how telescopes work, at least the big ones. All right. Well, thank you. Got, um, got one more question. Uh, what's the expected lifespan uh, for the tele James Webb telescope to operate? Great question. Um, so the nominal, the nominal life cycle of James Webb is actually only five years. So Hubble's already lasted 30, and this is a little terrifying to me that the nominal life cycle of James Webb is only five years. Now that said, uh, I actually don't know what the initial nominal lifetime of Hubble was, I'm guessing it was less than 10 years, and here we are 30 years later. Hubble's special, though, because astronauts have been up to visit it and have been able to replace things that break and you know, install new instrumentation. Um, we don't have that capability with James Webb because it's out, again, at L2 beyond the orbit of the moon. Um, James Webb actually has a lifetime of only five years because it needs fuel to maintain its orbit at L2. The L2 is actually a, an unstable Lagrange point. It's not a stable gravitational equilibrium. Uh, so it actually needs station-keeping fuel to stay there and to be able to point uh, accurately. And so eventually it will run low on fuel and probably it will go into some kind of, um, you know, limited user operations where maybe you're much more limited in where you can look in the sky at a given time. Yeah. Okay. We had another question here. Is James Webb actively cooled with a consumable liquid gas? That's great. That's a wonderful question. It is not. And this was actually a surprise to me. Uh, there is, well, so certainly in space, you have the advantage where it's cold, right? And that helps, you know, keeping your really, really cold instrumentation. But if you want to operate in the infrared, you need to be really cooled. And usually these kind of mid-infrared detectors are cooled by liquid helium. Um, astronomers who built the infrared CCDs used on James Webb, and I believe this was mostly a group at the University of Rochester, uh, certainly also some folks at the University of Arizona, which was my PhD alma mater, um, they have actually come up with a passive cooling system that gets these mid-infrared detectors down cold enough, uh, as long as they're in space, where it's already pretty cold, um, that they can you know, have nice high throughput without much dark current. That's great. I'm kind of curious, if L2 is an unstable orbit, is there any place they could have parked it where it would be stable and last a little longer? Well, you know, you could put it in Earth orbit, right? Uh, the problem with Earth orbit is, you know, half the time that there's a sun. And the L2 Lagrange point is great because the Earth shields the spacecraft from the uh, sun. Okay. Right? And, you know, and you have much more of the night sky to go look at. Uh, and you can do that 24 hours a day, 
right? You, you don't have half the time you're, you're in the sun. Uh, so that's why astronomers like the L2 Lagrange plane. James Webb is not the only telescope that will be at the L2. Um, there's a, uh, like, WMAP, which gave us our best picture of the cosmic microwave background, also sits at L2, for example. Um, yeah, I don't remember by which Lagrange points are stable. I want to say that the, the ones that make a triangle, I want to say that's L3 and L4, or maybe L4 and L5. I want to say those are stable, but I, I don't remember my orbital mechanics uh, class <laughs> well enough. Um, there are a few stable Lagrange points, but we like L2 because it's, the Earth shields the spacecraft from the sun. Okay. I, I see Alex has my face on here, which is interesting since you're the one talking. I should make like sock puppet um, <laughs> motions or something because I'm just watching you. It's kind of boring. Yeah. Um, yeah, the question is, anyone ask Elon Musk if he can try and serve as it? Maybe he's got some <laughs> other Tesla up there. So, you know, I was talking about this with a bunch of other astronomers recently, and they said, yeah, I think if Hubble gets, Hubble's a national, national treasure, right? And it's hard for me to believe that Hubble would just break and nobody would do anything about it. Um, I think this would be wonderful PR for SpaceX or for uh, Virgin Space or for whatever the other, uh, did I get Elon Musk's, what his, what's his space company? SpaceX. SpaceX, okay. Um yeah, I, I don't remember the different the different flavors of private space exploration companies, um, but I have to imagine this would be great PR for, <laughs> for their company. Yeah, you, know, you would think. I mean, they should be able to send something robotic up there at least. Exactly, exactly. So, so you know, we'll see. Um, I'm holding out hope. I'm I'm an optimist. I think when it comes to, I don't think we'll just give up if Hubble ceases operations. So we'll have James Webb, right? and James Webb is a wonderful infrared observatory. But James Webb is not a good optical observatory. It's actually pretty bad in the optical, and it has no ultraviolet capabilities. Huh, okay. So, you know, things like water vapor in the plumes of Europa, things like the aurora of the planets, things like what I like to do, uh, monitoring inner accretion flows around supermassive black holes, understanding uh, young stars, all of this requires ultraviolet observing. And we actually don't have a space telescope in, in any stage of planning that replicates what Hubble can do in the ultraviolet. So, you know, we would lose a lot of astronomical capabilities if Hubble died. Sounds like a good reason to send something else up there. All right. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any more questions. So I guess you're in the clear. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. I appreciate Thank all of the flexibility. Um, you know, I, I, I totally, we'll see if my six-year-old is still awake watching this, but I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. It was good to join you. Yep, thanks, thanks for coming. For So this was our inaugural online virtual lecture. Hopefully we don't have too many more of these, um, but it's a good way to distance ourselves. I'm not sure Dan's far enough away yet. But for the rest of us, <laughs> we can stay safe. Uh, Alex, do you have anything else? No. Th thanks, everybody, for joining. All right. This concludes the meeting. Have a good night. Good night.